Good morning. That was awesome. Thank you. How's everybody doing? That was, that was pretty good. This is plywood. Let's try it again. How are you guys doing? Yes, I like that. Well, thanks so much for having me. I really feel like this is one of the best events and one of the best things that happens here in Atlanta. So I'm really honored to be here. I think I've attended every single plywood up to this date. So it's really fun to be here on stage and get to share with you. Before I move forward, I do have a lot of friends in the audience, but in case there's confusion or you guys don't know who I am, I just want to kind of set expectations right to make sure there's no real confusion. I am not Uncle Mitchell from Modern Family. <laughs> he's a very handsome young man. I'm sure he's a nice guy, dresses well. I'm not him, unfortunately. just want to get that out there and make sure, you know, Everyone knows who I am. So I am really excited to be here. Jeff asked me uh, to share with you guys on a subject that I'm really passionate about. And uh, I feel like our world today needs a little more courage. Don't you guys agree with that? that? That courage is one of the most important character traits of this generation, I believe. And so I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a courage pep talk. Is that okay if I do that today? Okay. I know it's right before lunch. And, and I think every good pep talk has a couple things that I want to start with. So first is really good 80s music. Can we crank that up, sound guy? Yes. And flame transitions. Hold on. Let's go back. Can we... Hold on. Let's get the music going. Yes, look how real this fire looks. The screen is on fire. Come on, firewood people. Are you fired up? Yes, yes. Okay, it's good, thank you. Everyone feel better now? It felt good, didn't it? Yes. 80s music always makes everything a little bit better. So. I am here today to encourage you all to have more courage. I hope that after this session, you walk away feeling just a little bit more courageous in the work that you do, whatever it is. If you're a startup, if you're an entrepreneur, businessman, if you're a creative, if you're changing the world with whatever activist calling you have, I hope that you get a little bit more courageous after this time today. That is my hope for you. And uh, like Jeff mentioned, I'm in the branding world, and uh, I've been doing it for about 12 years, and I've, I've noticed a really interesting common scenario that I want to walk you guys through and, and see if you can relate to it. Is there any, any uh, creatives in the room? Just a quick show of hand if you would identify with that word creative. Any graphic designers? Yeah. What's, what's your name, sir? Brandon. Brandon. Okay. Everybody meet Brandon. <laughs> Everyone say, Hi, Brandon. Okay, so Brandon probably got into doing graphic design because he just loves to create. He loves to make. And one day he probably got a job and was really, really excited about that job. And he probably at some point had a project and he had a really good idea. I mean, he was like, I can't believe I just had this idea. This is going to make my career. This idea is going to change the world. And he started working really hard on that idea. He started slaving over it, making it just perfect. And he said, this is so good. I've got I've to get ready to show it off to the world. So he started to prepare his pitch. He got ready to introduce it to the people that needed to hear, maybe a boss, an art director, maybe an investor. And he goes to his boss and he says, hey, look at this idea. Isn't it amazing? This is the best idea I've ever come up with. And then what happens next? His boss or his art director, his client, crushes his idea. <laughs> crushes. And Brandon is devastated. Look at his face. What happened to this idea? And then it gets worse. Then his boss or his client says, actually, you know what? Why don't you consider this? What do you... Yeah. Yeah, you know what? Why don't we go run with this idea? I think this... Yeah, this makes sense. This will work. And next thing you know, Brandon <laughs> is totally confused saying, what just happened? I had this great idea, 
And now, and he's doing the best he can. He's like, man, I'm going to clean this thing up. I'm going to still give it a go. And then eventually he realizes that he can't make it better <laughs> than it is. And this is a really crucial moment for Brandon and for creatives alike, that if he doesn't learn how to respond in the right way, his whole career will start to look like this. <laughs> and next thing you know, he'll end up with work that he's not even proud of. And even worse, a little thing called indifference will start to set in. Indifference. Where he won't even care anymore. He'll have zero passion and he'll be okay with mediocrity. And so today as we think about courage, I want you to think about rejecting indifference. See, the opposite of courage is not fear, it's actually indifference. It's no longer caring anymore. And courage is the willingness to move forward, to go after what you really believe in, in the face of your fears, because you're determined to accomplish it. It's not void of fear, you're always gonna have fear, but being courageous is willing to step into what it is that you believe in, to reject indifference. And indifference is so bad because Brandon and creatives alike, I believe, are visionaries. We're idealists. We're purists. We see a better world out there. And it's our responsibility to move the needle towards that world. But if we let indifference settle in and take over, we'll never see that ideal future. We'll never see that better world. So I want to talk about rejecting indifference. How can we reject indifference not just um, if you're a creative, but if you're a business person, whatever it is that you're doing, let's talk about how you can reject indifference. So a couple years ago, I learned a little thing, a little formula that helps me kind of think about how to reject indifference. Q times A equals E. So the Q represents quality. How good can your work really be? If you're a photographer, how amazing can your pictures really be? If you're an illustrator, how good can you draw? If you're a businessman, how great can your business model be? Then the A actually represents acceptance or agreement. So the people that you're working with, do they agree? Do they accept your work? Do they buy into what it is? And that equals the end result, which is what the E represents. So there's two sides to the coin. It's not just about the quality. It's also about the acceptance. So in my case, if I create the most amazing logo in the world and I score it a 100, it's the best. But then I present it to a client and they hate it and they give it a zero, well, the end result is a zero. It's not 50, right? So it's a multiplier. So there's two different ways that we can start to think about how we reject indifference in the quality of our work, but then also in the acceptance and the agreement of the people that we have to work with. Because it's not fine art most of the time. The projects that you're doing involves other people. So let's talk about those two things. First, the cue. The cue is what we're all taught in school, really. Um, if you're a creative, if you went to school to learn graphic design or photography or whatever, the cue is really what's ingrained in us. And that's what most of us focus on um, all the time. And there's a couple different ways that we can think about rejecting indifference in the quality of our work. And I want to share a few with you. Is anyone familiar with Ira Glass, Radio Lab on NPR, a couple fans? He's amazing. He has this segment, um, I believe it was a couple years ago, where he talks about artists, designers, creatives, when they first get into whatever it is that they're doing, they have this high level of taste. You know, they can really spot and see what is good out there. And so they have this level of taste, but then as they start to create, their abilities are here. And all of a sudden they have this gap of where they feel like they're no good. Everything that they produce isn't as good as what they think good really means. And he said that the only way that you can start to close that gap is to relentlessly create. You have to be going, going, doing, doing, making, making. It's all about being committed to relentlessly creating. So at this point it's all about quantity over quality. It's not about self-curation. It's about just making in the masses. And that's the, the, the right route to try to close that gap between what you think is good and your own abilities. So whatever it is that you do today, think about where are you committed to relentlessly creating. If you're 
a photographer, maybe that's saying I'm going to do 50 pictures a week. If you're a businesswoman, maybe that means you're going to try to come up with three new product lines a week. Being committed, dedicated to this principle of relentlessly creating. Jeff mentioned that I organized the Atlanta chapter of Creative Mornings. So there's 120 chapters worldwide. Our chapter was the 11th. We've been around for about four years. Uh, we are one of the biggest and definitely the best looking group, I must say. Um, and what's interesting, it happens every month. It's a monthly breakfast lecture series uh, that's totally free. So come check it out, little plug, creativemornings.com. Uh, and one thing that's been amazing about Creative Mornings happening every month is it gives us an opportunity, so myself and the other folks that organize it, to think of things to do that are fun, that are different. It's at 8.30 a.m. in the morning on a Friday, so people are usually kind of quiet, kind of low, so we have to get their energy level up a bit, uh, just like with 80s music and, fl and flame transitions usually does the trick. So uh, I want to walk you through a few different ideas because as we've led creative mornings, we have to do it every month. So this idea of relentlessly creating is upon us, whether we like it or not. So uh, this is a, an old picture. I think this is towards when we first started. This, we have monthly themes. This theme was money. So we brought in, you know, the old-fashioned phone booth where you get to catch money. And Giselle is actually in the, these pictures, which I thought was really funny. So you can see her there. She got locked in it. She had 30 seconds to grab as much money as she could. She had a blast. <laughs> it was awesome. Another month, uh, the theme was bravery. And we have name tags. And one of the name tags said, uh, my biggest fear is blank. And we looked for people in the crowd that wrote public speaking. And there was someone who wrote public speaking. And so we went and found her, and I got her up on stage with me to do the introductions. But I, I helped her out. I gave her these index cards to read, but they were like planted jokes. You know, like, so she's like, I want to thank MailChimp, our sponsor. Blake is really handsome. And then she, uh, she announced this guy was single, the picture on the top left, and his phone number is a friend of mine. So it was really, <laughs> really fun. He didn't get many phone calls, but, hey, it was worth a shot. Uh, we, we hit a pinata one time on stage, and we learned that you should not have a pinata near the edge of the stage and have someone hitting it with go-go boots on. She was okay. Liz survived, uh, but it was a lot of fun. We also one time had this big wheel that we spun. The theme was risk, and so we kind of played this game show, risk versus reward. Depending on where you landed, you either got a prize or you had to do some sort of risk. And uh, this guy here, he had to lead the whole room in the Pledge of Allegiance. That was his risk. It was really funny. I was surprised he knew it. We when was the last time he sang the Pledge of Allegiance? Uh, this guy had to eat something and wear a crazy Viking helmet. So, you know, the picture says it all. One time we uh, had just the audience do blind caricatures. So that's where you look at the person next to you and you draw them without looking at your paper. You can see one on the far right. It's really funny. Uh, another time, the theme was robots. We kind of had this robot mascot that we got to take pictures with. And then we had the whole room do the robot. You know, it was pretty awesome to see 400 people stand up and start doing the robot. There's my wife on the far right. Look at her. Her robot's way better than mine. We had a pie eating contest one time. That was a lot of fun. You can't go wrong with a pie eating contest. Um, one time, we played Connect Four in front of everyone. And at the last minute, I put together the uh, Connect Four set, and I'm pretty sure it's made for five-year-olds to put together, and I put it together wrong. And when you drop a, the re first red coin that went in, it went straight to the bottom, and the game was over, and it was a huge failure, but everyone laughed, and it was a lot of fun. And we also tried to break the world record with the loudest noise ever made by Pop Rocks. <laughs> so this is a shot from that. I love the picture of this young lady in the front row. She's like, oh. What is a pop rock? Oh, and we didn't, we didn't break it. We failed. But it was still a lot of fun. So as we've had these experiences and try to be as kooky and fun and crazy and creative as we can be, what we've learned is that even when things go wrong, that wrong turns just help us make better maps. And the idea of relentlessly creating is that there's freedom in failure. You shouldn't be afraid to fail that you should be in a place where it's okay to have a bad idea. It's okay to put together the, the game wrong and everyone will laugh and it's okay. But wrong turns just help us make better maps. So I hope you have freedom 
in that. I want you to be more courageous in being dedicated to relentlessly creating. As we think about rejecting indifference, it's also really important to consider the context in which you're in and to choose the right context. And I don't necessarily mean the physical context. You know, that's always important, the environment that you work in. More so, I I mean the people that are around you. So are the people that are around you, are they challenging you to really be better in the quality of your work? Are they rejecting indifference with you or are they just settling for mediocrity? Because we become like those that we surround ourselves with. And if you're not putting people around you that are holding your feet to the fire, that are challenging you, that are giving you the truth, then maybe you need to ask yourself a really courageous question and say, am I in the right place? There's a friend of mine named Chris Coleman. She gave a Creative Mornings talk. And she said, if you're considering leaving a job, the first question you need to ask yourself is, will anyone here tell me the truth? So are you surrounded by people that will tell you the truth? If not, maybe you need to have a little courage this morning and consider which context you should be in. Okay, so that's a few things on the quality side. As we think about that A, the agreement, the relationships, the people that we work with, this is where it gets a little tricky. The A is all about people. Raise your hand if you're a person. A couple people? Okay, great. Keep your, hand, hold on, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. All right, look to someone with their hands up and say, you're crazy. You're crazy. Everybody is crazy. Can we just admit that? When you work with people, you're going to work in some crazy. And the more you accept that, the better off you'll be. So when we think about the A and how to reject indifference in our relationships, We have to just embrace that there's going to be a little bit of some chaos. And that we really have to have hard conversations. We have to choose. We have to have courage to choose the hard conversations. This is where I struggle the most. If you set the right expectations up front on a project, the rest of the project is going to be much, much easier. But a lot of times we, we just accept indifference, don't we? We have a conflict with someone And when you say, oh, I'm sure it'll go away, or we just move past it because we we don't have a willingness to move towards that and to have the hard conversation. I learned something a few years ago, um, this idea of hard easy or easy hard. So when you're in a project, you have the opportunity to have the hard conversation up front, clarify expectations, deliverables, whatever it is, and that will make sure that the rest of the project is actually easy. But if you choose to have the easy conversation up front, you will probably have some hard stuff to deal with on the back half. So it's up to you. You can have the hard easy or the easy hard. It's up to us. We have that choice. So we have to be courageous. We have to reject indifference. We have to choose to have hard conversations. And when bumps do arise, when we do get into conflict, it's really important to understand then be understood. So in my case, if I present something to a client, let's say it's red like this screen here, and the client says, you know what, I don't know if I like that. I'm a big, die-hard Auburn fan, War Eagle. And that reminds me of the University of Georgia. I don't love the Bulldogs so much. So it's really important at that moment. That's clearly a crazy comment if we're talking about corporate identity or branding colors to incorporate your SEC football alliance, but it happens a lot, (laughs) a lot. So I have a choice in that moment to respond the right way. So what's helpful if I say, okay, so let me see if I'm hearing you right. You're a big Auburn fan, got that, and you really have a bad perception of red because the University of Georgia. Is that that what I'm hearing you right? Okay. Well, from my perspective, I really want to encourage you to be objective in this. And we're creating this identity not just for yourself, but for the end user. And their perception of red is probably more about passion and energy and courage. So I think that we'll be okay with that. If if you can get, is is that okay if you can accept that? And now all of a sudden I've, I've reflected back to them, their concern, but then I've also made my perspective known. So this is also great marriage advice for anyone that would like that. And you have to have courage to listen. 
that's where it gets really hard because you instantly want to jump on that bad comment or you instantly want to make your perspective known. But you have to call a timeout and be calm, be confident in who you are, and then just simply state back what you heard. So if I'm hearing you correct, this is your concern. Then you can make your perspective known. So in closing, you are a visionary. You are an idealist. The world needs your business. The world needs your project. The world needs your brand. And it's your responsibility to let the world see what you have in store. It's your responsibility to move the needle just a little bit more towards that ideal future that you have in mind. And if you can reject indifference, if you can fight a little bit, if you can have a little bit of courage in being dedicated to relentlessly creating, to putting yourself in the right context, to winning others over by understanding, then making your perspective understood, choosing to have those hard conversations, then I really truly believe that you'll go from that to this. Thank you. So good. That was good.